very individualized problems and uh, you do a wonderful job. So thank you so much for your presentation. And hi everyone, I'm Dean Melway. I'm, uh, you could, I, I would describe myself as a, a young at heart, uh, white male with a, a gray goatee and, and pretty much gray hair as well. And I'm uh, very happy to be uh, stepping in and, and uh, trying to fill the, the big boots that Tara wears. So she did a great job in the first half of this, first three quarters of this. And I'm here to sort of introduce the last group and, and try and wrap this up. It's been a fantastic couple of days. It, it really has. I, uh, I bring to this, uh, this area a, a lifelong uh, lived experience. I was two years old when I acquired polio just before the last uh, uh, big uh, um, East Coast uh, shows my roots uh, epidemic of polio. It was the last one before the solid vaccine uh, affecting my legs mostly. And I, I walk with crutches or use a wheelchair, more, more a wheelchair now. And, and the Queen's celebrating 70 years and it's 70 years that I've been happily living with polio and, and I've had a wonderful, great life and it isn't over yet. And events like this really rejuvenate me and get me keen to, to keep going. Uh, it's my responsibility and pleasure now to introduce the, the final panel. Uh, it's a, a panel that uh, I've been looking forward to to because the employment is an area that is really important for people with disabilities. And so I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, the session will be moderated by David Baines, a key member of the Distinct Ability Team and one of the leading global authorities on assistive technology. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, in, in, at least acknowledge our, our panelists and then I'll ask, uh, I'll ask David to properly introduce them. So. We, we are pleased today to have Karen Wheeler, co-leader of Live, Work, Play, Lauren Wallace, employment specialist with Innovative Community Support Solutions, and Zoe Schban, business and accessibility consultant with Incubator 13. We're so looking forward to the wealth of knowledge that you bring to this discussion and thank you for joining us. So David, I'll let you start the introductions and take over. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to join you. Um, my name's David Baines. Uh, I've been described as what Father Christmas would look like if he let himself go. Um, and it's probably as accurate as I need it to be, particularly as uh, I'm speaking to you uh, today from Brussels in Europe. Um, so it's getting on for 9.30 at night. Um, so when somebody said, you know, are we going to overrun? I can promise you this session will not overrun. Uh, because my bed is behind me and it's waiting for me. Um, so it really is very, very good to join you um, and on behalf of Distinctability uh, and uh, the team. I, I really just wanted to set the scene slightly before we introduce uh, uh, our speakers. Um, the last few years have seen significant change in almost every aspect. Uh, of what we're doing uh, around access and inclusion in the workplace. Um, our understanding of what we mean by disability continues to evolve, that that links in with diversity and inclusion uh, and is very much pervasive in recognizing that disability pervades right across every aspect of people's lives. And I have to say that much the same can be said of the technologies that we're going to discuss, the assistive technologies and accessibility. Uh, it was very interesting just hearing the end of the Tetra session and thinking about how some of those technologies for the home actually increase in the old opportunities in the workplace. We're seeing changes in employment which have been accelerated as a result of the pandemic um, and really beginning to be challenged as to what do we mean by a workplace. Uh, is that a shared space? Is that the home? Is that the office as it's traditional, uh, the factory? Is it a blend or a hybrid between the two? Um, and they haven't yet really grasped well, how some of the changes that happened as a result of the pandemic, uh, the implications of things like working from home, what those mean on a social and emotional level uh, for people with disabilities. We've also seen huge trends in technology 
and put it off. You heard some of those earlier on. This shift towards much greater mobile and portable technologies, including in the workplace, the use of wearables, um, almost pervasive computing, which follows us regardless of where we are. Um, but most importantly, I think, when we think about accommodations in the workplace is mainstreaming. Not We're seeing many of the technologies that we used to add on to our computers now well integrated into the operating system. And we're seeing mainstream applications designed for the whole population offering significant benefits to those with disabilities. So everything is in a state and flux of change. That's an exciting opportunity. And really, I'm really pleased to introduce our, our three speakers uh, and to be thinking about those opportunities as they appear and what we want to do about those. So I'm going to ask uh, each of our speakers to just very briefly introduce themselves. Just to explain my background, I've been working in assistive and accessible technology for about 40 years. Um, and in, during that time, I've worked in different parts of the world, in Europe. But I spent a number of years uh, working in the Middle East, uh, within Qatar, I'm working within the Gulf, um, really trying to think about how do we address needs uh, where language and culture is very different, perhaps to uh, our own personal experience. Um, but let's just uh, start. Keenan, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. you hear me okay? Great. Okay. Well, my name is uh, Keenan Weller. I am the co-leader and director of communications at Live, Work, Play, a charitable organization I've been with for 27 years, 25 of them uh, more or less, my current role. I'm going on 54 years of age, white man with gray hair. I'm told I look something like actor Tim Robbins, uh, perhaps 10 years ago, as he's a bit older than me. So hopefully I have a uh, giant coffee mug that is intended for backcountry camping. I am sporting a black golf shirt with a bumblebee logo, which represents the possibilities taking flight uh, philosophy of our organization. My live background features a huge grid of photography on canvas that I created while exploring the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And I not only connect with the indigenous community as um, guardians of our watershed, it's very important to me, but also through their suffering as victims of institutional discrimination. That is a history shared by people with intellectual disabilities, uh, which is the, the population we support, who in uh, 2009 in Ontario were finally freed from mass institutions like the one in Smith Falls. It's just a short drive from my home here in Ottawa. And I want to note that uh, uh, systemic discrimination remains a critical barrier to the inclusion of, of both of those communities and, and other marginalized populations. And uh, improving on that is something I will work on for the rest of my days. And certainly when people have a, a job in a, in a, in a business or workplace that is part of our daily lives, that is just one of those indications that real change is happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keenan. Uh, Lauren, um, over to you. How would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lauren Wallace. I'm an employment specialist from Innovative Community Support Services, or ICSS, and I've been in this role for almost a year. Uh, I'm a white woman. I'm wearing a navy blue dress with white flowers on it, and my, I have brown hair, brown eyes, and my hair is in a bun with a blue navy blue uh, 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 hair bow. Um, I'm currently in our office in Orleans. Um, behind me is a window. It's currently thunderstorming, so if the light's changing throughout, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, and we also have my cabinets here that are full of our one-to-one -one activities. Um, so I work for ICSS Employment Solutions. We work with adults with developmental disabilities to help them gain meaningful employment. So we work with one-on-one -on -one sessions um, with our individuals, our job seekers as we call them, um, through many skill building activities, um, depending on which role they wanna do um, in the workforce. We do everything from teaching them how to clean, how to do dishes properly, how to do laundry. And we uh, actually have the facility here to allow us to explore those skills with the individuals. Um, from there, we build on their resume skills and we build their resumes. We also work with them to do interview skills and we assist them with the interviews. Something unique about our program too is we offer job coaching, which is ongoing support to individuals uh, in the workplace to allow them to be successful. 
This looks like we uh, shadow them on their first couple of shifts to see any accommodations need to be made. A kind of unique uh, aspect of it is we work as the accommodation as well for the individual. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lord. And last but not least, Zoe, uh, do please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Zoe Schwan. I've never actually done a uh, description of myself before like this. Um, I am a white woman with short, spiky brown hair, wearing red glasses and wearing a blue t-shirt. And behind me is a very boring white ball. I'm also wearing white earphones to better hear everyone. So yes, I am Zoe Schwan. I am a business and accessibility consultant currently working with Incubator 13. We are currently doing our third cohort of a program for disabled entrepreneurs. We're helping them start their businesses and make them realize basically that they are able to do it. So that's what I do with Incubator. And then on the side, I also do entrepreneur coaching one-on-one -on -one for disabled entrepreneurs at any stage of their business. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Thank, thank you so much, Zoe. Uh, it's, it's great to have you all. Um, let's let's just start by by thinking. In, in the last few years, we've seen this really significant shift to increase accessibility and inclusion within the workplace. And maybe part of that trend has been away from that being part of corporate and social responsibility and goodwill from employers towards the more towards the development of formal policy and employment standards and really inclusion in the workplace became more systemic um, and definitely that some of those shifts some of those trends have been accelerated by the pandemic and by many employers right across the world um, needing to respond to innovate and find solution to support people to work remotely, both people with disabilities and of course the much wider workforce uh, at all. So let's just start off and I'm, I'm maybe keen, maybe you could just kick us off. Uh, can you just comment and provide just any thoughts that you have on this trend towards this greater accessibility in the workplace? Thank you so much. That was actually a really good introduction. I think that transition from goodwill to something more is, is really uh, strikes at the heart of what I'd want to say. So I, I would take this opportunity just to make a uh, direct appeal because I know some of them are in our audience. So researchers, policy folks, uh, anyone who can really help with this issue because uh, the inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities, autistic persons, or we could just say that, you know, the neurodiverse population in these policies and employment standards that are, uh, it, it's really not happening. Uh, it's, it's something happening adjacent to it, or it's still mostly as a a product of goodwill. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with, we just have really lousy data. Uh, it's the old adage about what's not seen or, or counted doesn't matter. And that's, that's really how it feels when it comes to employment and people with intellectual disabilities. We really need disaggregated data. We need to understand these um, subpopulations within this big category of disability, you know, which are the most marginalized. And so if we do that, uh, we can develop policies and expectations that deliver real change that doesn't get buried in you know misleading statistics about progress which might be prog progress for some but but not for others uh, if that seems a little abstract let me put it this way you know if we see there's a statistical increase in average wages but um, it's only for you know it's only benefiting middle-aged men we wouldn't really celebrate that as a win for labor market equality right so depending on how you you parse the data uh, people with intellectual disabilities have an unemployment rate that's double that of the, the disability population in general. So it's a group that's it's still not advancing very quickly or maybe even falling further behind. So we just have to be careful uh, what we're celebrating. That was a bit of a downer. So I just want to let you know that uh, you know, later on, I'm going to talk about some historic successes and advancements in the hiring of people with intellectual disabilities. And that includes employers who are definitely going uh, above and beyond they aren't motivated by someone telling them, you know, you need to be more inclusive and accessible. They're really hungry to do it as both a business decision and as, as a value proposition. So that's that's what you want when those two things go together. But on just touching on the issue of remote work and virtual work, I have to say we are 
really pleasantly surprised that after the initial shock of everything kind of shutting down in the early days of the pandemic, uh, very few of the more than 200 people we we're actively supporting from employment lost their jobs. And, and uh, going from a fraction of them working from home to almost all of them working from home, it was a huge amount of, you know, mostly unpaid work on our part to make it happen, but it was very successful. And uh, I'll stop there and, and add to these points later or in response. Yeah, to thank you. That's great. Tim, I just want to touch upon one thing, because I think I think language is, is, is a very interesting issue, because that's evolved so quickly in recent years. You, you, you obviously use the term intellectual disabilities. It's one which I would recognize as being quite clear. But quite often we hear phrases like neurodiversity used. Mm -hmm. um, and that just just for clarity, really, rather than uh, anything else, what do you see as the relationship between those two terms when we're talking about accommodations in the workplace? Well, that could be a whole presentation, but I think, I, know. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we support people with uh, developmental disabilities, but, you know, we adopted the term intellectual disabilities years ago because our, our members preferred it. Uh, but there are many autistic persons and the vast majority prefer to be called autistic and not a person with autism. So that's another language piece, but you know, many of them would identify as part of the neurodiverse community, but they do not necessarily have an intellectual disability. So yeah. I'm, I'm just using a, you know, kind of a, a neurodiverse is a, a broader category that would take into account uh, more people, you know, non-standard communicators, um, mm -hmm. other, other, other things that uh, if I think of my federal government colleagues, they're uh, starting to use that term more frequently because it's, it's, uh, it's their way of taking a step towards kind of disaggregating uh, from the broader population and just saying something that's not, it's not physical, uh, it's this other stuff and it's a step in that direction. And so uh, I hope that sort of answers your question. I could go on. No, it does. It, it's really <laughs> helpful because I think okay. when, we, when we talk about accommodations, diversity is one thing, but disability is perhaps a little bit more focused. Uh, and it's sometimes it's helpful to distinguish between the two. Um, Lauren, do you want to add anything and just more about this, uh, this trend, this shift towards increased accessibility that we're seeing? Yeah, so I was going to say um, we're in really strange times right now because two years ago, a lot of my job seekers were unable to even apply to a lot of jobs. There wasn't a lot of jobs on the market and a lot of entry level jobs that our clients are looking for. Now there's an abundance of jobs and a lot of jobs out there, but it's getting our word out um, to employers to hire inclusively. We got to keep in mind, there's over 600,000 Canadians with disabilities that are able to work and are willing to work. They just don't have the accommodations or the processes needed to allow them to be successful in the workplace. Um, I also want to say, right, I feel like this huge trend that we're seeing right now is people just being more open about talking about their disabilities. The amount of, um, employers I talked to lately that said, do you know what? We've had employers that have worked here for 30 years and we had no clue they had mental health issues or that they had challenges um, with their physical body. It, people are now being more open with their challenges or with their disabilities and realizing, employers are realizing they've been hiring inclusively all along, um, which is a huge step. And that is allowing for um, the culture, the workplace culture, to be more inclusive. You know, if if Tim, an accountant, already is working really successfully in uh, having a disability, why can't we hire someone else with that? Um, another huge thing I think is social media and individuals using social media um, to share their success stories and employers being more out there sharing their stories of success with hiring inclusively. Um, it's really opening our door to our job seekers. I, I think that's really interesting. Uh, I think you know, one of the things that becomes quite interesting is trying to pick out of that which factors meant that we've always in, employed people on an inclusive basis. What made that successful? And, and why is it that uh, we, we now have more people coming in? We may need to make different accommodations. What has changed uh, and what are the variables? Maybe that's something we can come back to a little bit later, particularly when we think about the different types of workplace. Um, but Zoe, um, over to you. Hey, what, what would you like to add to this discussion at this point? I, I've just been fascinated with what everyone's been saying, but um, I guess I can speak a little bit to the language, language um, concept. 
because I know that right now there are so many different views and opinions out there about language when it comes to disability. And it's so personal for everyone. And it's so hard to say this is the right term because it may be for someone, but then for someone else, it's incredibly offensive or just doesn't suit them for whatever reason. And it's become a very big topic, I find. Like also, like it was said on social media too, people are coming out more and more yeah. saying, yes, I am disabled. And some people prefer individual with disability while some people prefer disabled individual. And there's so many different variations out there. And I think what's most important is for us to be open and accepting to all of them and asking people directly, how do you identify? Do you identify as someone with a disability or do you not? Um, and I think it's good that we're kind of going towards that more and more. Slowly but surely people are coming out more and more saying that they are disabled more so than they used to. And I think that's great. And, and I'm really interested because <clears throat> um, there was a trend towards greater inclusion of people with disabilities in the in the world. We said over the last few years, and then we had this huge change into what we meant by the workplace. Some people working remotely, some people working within an office, some people working in hybrid models. What was really interesting is we're not the process. We talk about policies and processes earlier. Did you find that in talking to employers? that they've had to make significant change to their thinking about how they're going to accommodate rather than just what those accommodations are. Um, again, maybe, maybe Keenan, again, have, have you seen that change from employers? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting factors driving that, including just uh, realities of the labor market. So most employers are uh, experiencing uh, difficulty uh, finding employees. So that's opened some doors and open uh, willingness to to listen. And it's not because, uh, you know, employers were against people with disabilities. I think when the labor market's a bit different and you have applicants flooding your doors, um, having these conversations, it's, it's not necessarily the first thing you're doing. You're just uh, busy hiring and, and doing your thing. So I think interestingly, during the pandemic, it was an opportunity to get into some uh, conversations with people who frankly had time and were thinking ahead to how am I going to solve some of these issues uh, going forward with recruiting yeah. um, and retention. So I, I think that was a, a really interesting outcome. And then, you know, our we had some really interesting experiences with a giant employer like the the federal government. Uh, of Canada, because we're here in Ottawa, uh, but also with, uh, you know, the, the smallest uh, kind of mom and pops and and uh, both have, have, have really impressed us in ways uh, of just being willing to uh, go above and beyond and maybe sometimes even in spite of uh, policy that's a little outdated and it's it's waiting a review or something if you look at the big employer, uh, whereas the mom and pop can, can be a bit more nimble, but often it's something they've never done before and they're nervous and, you know, they're saying things, you know, they have all these legitimate fears and, uh, you know, I see Lauren shaking your head and others because you just learn after a while, you have to kind of start these conversations with, uh, if you can't allay those fears, then you can't get into the conversation, but the openness around, uh, I think the pandemic freed us to just say things like, I know you're afraid what'll happen, you have to fire them. I'll be a, this awful person that fired this guy with a disability. Uh, when when that, that make me a bad person, and so just having these real genuine, jargon-free, honest human conversations, I honestly think that's been the biggest change, even more than technology. Uh, but uh, I think through the technology, we've also had barriers vanish uh, that we never anticipated how it, doors would open because of the an issue for our population is many don't drive. Um, and public transit has its limits and we would be turning down opportunities all the time because we do the math and like there's no way uh, they can get to there and back like they'll be losing money and be on the bus so long uh, and then doors open to positions uh, not just in Ottawa but it could work somewhere else uh, hmm. and so it's been pretty amazing I would just say. I'm, may I just ask Lauren to come in there. Lauren I mean one of the interesting things um, I think there's two issues that arise out of this is one is whether or not the, the accommodations that people are making are consistent. Uh, are the, the accommodations that we made in the old the old workplace 
do they carry through to the new workplace? But also in terms of the, that process, how does that work when managers may not see their employees face to face uh, more than on the odd occasion, uh, and even within a hybrid model, have much less time to to work with and understand the people that they're that are part of their teams? How have you found that out? Um, so we've definitely faced that with the hybrid model. Um, something I really want to point out is a lot of times employers think accommodations are these big expensive things where 57% of accommodations cost under $500 and majority of those are free or very low cost. So individuals, um, employers might not realize that s simple things like a checklist or simple things like um, having a to-do list for an individual can be an accommodation. Um, a lot of employers, you know, they really are scared or um, not accepting of accommodations because they really do think it's a big deal and a big change and a lot has to be changed for them to be in place. Um, another big thing with employers is a lot of them see, well, why is it fair if I give it to this person just because they have a disability? How is it fair to the rest of my team? We got to keep in mind it's not about... Um, equal like having everyone you want everyone on the equal playing field and through accommodations that allows that for job performance to be uh the same or if not better than other employees with accommodations um talking back on to the point of hybrid models in in the workplace um something i really wanted to touch on was a lot of our job seekers really struggled with the hybrid interview processes Mm. Um, a, a lot of them did not have uh, uh, reliable technology to do online interviews or uh, over screen interviews. And a lot of them really struggled to show their personality over the screen. A lot of this is, you know, a lot of people forget when you're in an interview, you're also interviewing the interviewer, right? You are seeing their vibe. You are sensing what the vibe is around the office you don't get that over a screen, right? A lot of our individuals, you know, they can't say, did I speak enough? Did I not? Did, did you think that was a good answer? Because they can't read the person's body language. They only see their head up, right? They're not seeing how many notes they're taking or, you know, if they're actually doodling on their pad in front of them because mm -hmm. they're not interested, right? They can't see that or sense that in the room. And we've noticed since the shift lately, the last couple of months of being in person, our interview success rate has gone through the roof. It's almost four times. Really the interesting. Because they have that opportunity to show uh, and get the vibe too. And, and that's very much about being able to take nonverbal feedback uh, from that process and respond to that. People may need help and support to understand nonverbal feedback but it's a really important part of that process so yeah would, would, would that be something which you've come across as well uh, sorry you muted sorry about that that is actually right, one example <laughs> that's actually one example that's very non-verbal <laughs> of how virtual uh, virtual work can be confusing Sorry about that. But what I was saying is that um, I've only ever really done this work virtually because I started in this field two years ago, right when the pandemic started. So I'm only used to speaking virtually. But I have noticed that there are some challenges. For example, when I'm teaching a class, some people don't have their, their cameras on. And like, like it was just said before, that it's very hard for me to then see whether my students are understanding or enjoying the course. So that's definitely a big one. Another one that is still a work in progress, I think for a lot of people is closed captioning and live transcripts and all those accommodations when it comes to Zoom and any other platform. It's often an afterthought or not even at all. And I've actually attended webinars before where someone has asked, is there closed captioning? And they just said, no, there isn't, sorry. And it wasn't even kind of considered or it wasn't even like talked about after that. It was just kind of dismissed so the person couldn't participate. And I think that working virtually has brought up a lot of these issues, which is, which is good and it's about time. <laughs> I think that, that, that's really interesting. 
And I think listening to, to the three of you, you speak, what strikes me is that, you know, the background, the environment within which we're making accommodations has changed. And that may have challenged some of the ways in which we make those accommodations. Um, and it, I want to just sort of move us on slightly and start to think about this issue of assistive technology and accessible technology. Because we have this, 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 this interesting position where uh, the setting within which the accommodation is going to be made may vary from week to week, month to month, even day to day. And that's quite challenging in terms of setting up processes and procedures. Um, and I'm interested to know um, a little bit from you. Uh, what's been your experience of educating and supporting employees through this process about how they can make those accommodations, particularly in that area of assistive and accessible technology. Um, again, uh, maybe uh, Kieran, you could just start us off there. Sure. Uh, I definitely defer to, I've been listening as much as I can the past uh, two days and uh, I am not the uh, technology mm -hmm expert but there's been some i would just say like uh, dave i think you made the earlier point a lot of these technologies that are being developed for the mainstream have benefited um, all the people we support as well even if it's intended for a completely uh different audience or recipient but i would say you know one of the comical it's, it's not funny because it's it's tragic in the moment but if i look at you know a well-resourced a place like a, a federal government department uh sometimes it's still the experience in in terms of accommodations that you go to something called an accommodation center and what you need is your supervisor to send you your work uh in a different way uh not a big long email with attachments or you know uh break it up or can i have a video or could it be this uh could i have a checklist uh but the accommodation center is like we have these really cool workstations. Would that help you? And they're like, no, that won't help me at all. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there's still a bit of a disconnect uh, when it comes to, um, you know, kind of reorganizing or presenting information differently. And there's been some great presentations about that. But I would say that's still an evolving issue. And it's still very grassroots. Like we host our own sort of, it's called the Federal Employment Strategy Group. We just met today. And it's basically public servants just choosing to come to this um, in, in pretty big numbers. And we just talk about these issues. And now we have all these middle manager, HR people who've done all this and they can share with somebody else, but it's not systematized yet. Like it's not a standard practice. You, there's not really a place to go to and get these solutions. So we're kind of at the stage of just working on how do we normalize that you know, having your supervisor or peers communicate with you differently is is also a, a mainstream type of accommodation. It's not all about, you know, a desk that has a crank on it, which is also very important, but not necessarily what we're looking for. But on, on that uh, informal level, I've seen uh, incredible uh, solutions developed by just amazing, dedicated people. And let's uh, just sort of, um, I think it was Lauren, uh, I think Lauren, you, you talked a little bit about this need for equity in terms of accommodations. Um, and of course, one of the really interesting things, and we certainly found this a distinctability working with employers, is that many of the accommodations around technology are already built into the devices that every employee has got. And that sort of makes us start to think, well, maybe it's not just about accommodating an individual, but trying to think about how do we make sure the entire workforce knows what's available to them and how it might benefit them. Um, and I'm just interested to know in your experience, you know, how conscious are employers of what they've already bought and have given to every employee, and which could be helpful to us? No, we've definitely had the experience, especially in um, smaller businesses as well, right? Um, or sometimes their brain automatically goes to this big thing that we need to change or we need to mm -hmm. move departments instead of can be a really easy fix. I have a really good example of this. We have a job seeker. He works at Value Village in the donation area where individuals, they drop off their donations, he brings them in. Um, we received uh, an email saying, unfortunately, they're gonna have to move them departments. And when we really investigated it, we realized when they were using the forklift to move donations around, 
Um, due to um, the type of autism he has, he has a very, he has very diff a lot of difficulty with spatial awareness and things around him. Due to this uh, fact, he was um, becoming a safety hazard uh, around this forklift because he was not aware that he would be in its path and it was becoming very dangerous. So the employer automatically thought, okay, I'm gonna accommodate that. They're gonna be moved departments. It's all gonna work out. Where realistically we stepped in and all we ended up doing was putting a duct tape square on the ground. And when the individual sees uh, somebody using a, a forklift, they have to go and stand and we called it the safety square. Um, uh, and the individual would be out of the way of the driver and also be safe. Um, this accommodation actually got approved by like regional managers mm -hmm. came in just to see how simple, you know, it costs us no money at all, just duct tape on the floor, accommodations can be. Instead of having to retrain the individual in the new role, it can be as simple as that. And I think, I think there's all sorts of other uh, interesting things uh, that, that we can see. I mean, for me, one of the, the interesting things that's happened in assistive technology in recent years has been the growth of uh, voice control. And you know, we heard earlier about the uh, what my wife refers to as the A word, uh, Alexa. Um, and voice control is built into many, many of the devices we've got already, and it allows us to dictate. Now, this was a technology that was perhaps wonderful for people with physical disabilities who found a traditional keyboard difficult, but it's also been very good for people with dyslexia who find it difficult to enter large parts of text. But it's actually really good for anyone who might struggle with some pain or discomfort in their hands or in their arms, in their shoulders, maybe not all day, but maybe towards the end of the working day. So understanding that the technology that we've got built into Windows, built into Google Documents and so on, can actually benefit any and all employees, provides us with a platform to build for more specific accommodations for individuals. And that's about an inclusive workplace for everyone, as well as accommodating specific needs. And Zoe, I mean, I'm interested to know in, in your experience, that balance of accommodation between thinking about the whole workforce as a diverse workforce, who can benefit from what we make available and specific intervention for one person at a time. Where do you see that balance? What's, what's the important dimensions to that for you? I, I actually love this question and this topic because I think we don't realize, people don't realize that everyone has certain needs, certain accessibility needs, even if it's just um, earphones or glasses, even just to be able to see better. And I think we don't realize how mainstream and commonplace it is. And I think we see disability and accommodation as this big, scary thing that again, will be too expensive or too pricey, too challenging. And we don't notice that it's all around us already. Yep. And I think making it more mainstream and more less taboo, I guess is the right word maybe, is so important because then people will feel comfortable and tell you what they need. And again, I, I just have to say, Lauren, I love that story about the safety square. I think that's really cool. And I think that that's really important that we just start thinking outside the box. And, and that really, and it's, it's such an important point, So I'm really glad you took I, I, for many, many years, we talked about the biggest barrier to the use of assistive technology was awareness. And there's still some truth in that. I'm here in Brussels with Microsoft, and that's exactly one of the things they've been saying here. But it's not the only barrier, because that creative use of the tools we have, and as you say, thinking outside the box, which in Lauren's case was just some duct tape, and thinking actually this could be the accommodation we need. But that sense of creativity. And how do we help employers not just to comply and have minimal compliance in accommodations, but to think imaginatively, creatively about how they do that, whether it's for one employee or for all their employees. And, and Lauren, because you, you, this is your fault, you started us down this route. So I'm going to turn to you first this time, Lauren. 
and say, how, how do we get that imagination into those accommodation process? Um, so my thought right now, it goes straight to job carving. So what job carving is, is um, it's a job that didn't exist uh, prior to one of our job seekers coming into a workplace. So what it entails, um, main example right now, we have an individual just starting his first week at a restaurant in uh, downtown Ottawa. Um, he applied for a line cook position and uh, prep cook. And there was a lot of barriers we could see with him being successful in that role. So something we did is job carving. The employer could see all of the, um, a lot of the tasks that were taking away, uh, repetitive tasks that were taking uh, his employers, his other prep cooks away. Um, he was able to step into that role. You know, they make everything fresh in house and he's able to um, cut the buns repetitively for hours and, and uh, make burgers repetitively. And I've never had an employer pull me aside before and said, thank you. I didn't realize how much, you know, we needed this role until we've had it. He's like, the productivity of my other employees has went through the roof. We're getting stuff done that we normally do in three days in one day because he is able to take away these tasks. So I think job carving is a huge aspect of that. Um, we have many other examples of that as well. Very good. And, and Zoe, I mean, in terms of that imaginative process, that, that thinking outside the box, to use the phrase you used, um, have you got any examples or other, other examples where people are doing that? That's a good question. Um, honestly, I think this whole, with the pandemic, is that everything is now possibly virtual is a big, a big thing right now that people are able to do things hybrid. Like, for example, they can come in for a meeting if that they want to do in person or they can stay home for that meeting and then work from home. So I think that, like I said, thinking outside the box and doing some things at home, some things in the workplace and being accommodating in that way has been really, really beneficial. That was one of the actual good things during the pandemic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the main thing for me is that I've been able to do things from home. Um, commuting is sometimes an issue um, without being able to drive. I think that's a big one. Um, yeah, but just being open to all of these different different possibilities is what's important. And one of the things that we hear a lot of people talking about when we're thinking about this process is this idea of co-design of accommodations, bringing people with disabilities and the employers together to think about how accommodations could be made more systematic, more systemic in the workplace. And many... Um, disabled people's organizations have called for much greater involvement of employees with disabilities in that decision making. But that brings with it a couple of challenges. I mean, there was a great question from the audience um, uh, during, during whilst we were talking and saying that you know, they, they, they've had employers in different sectors approach them um, to help improve accommodations which was in many ways extra work for them, which didn't actually receive any extra compensation. It wasn't part of their core tasks. Um, and I'm just interested to know, you know, how do we square that circle? How do we help engage and involve employees with disabilities in building that inclusive culture and accommodating needs, not only for themselves, but by future employees, without exploiting them and using their experience um, in ways which are unfair and unreasonable. Keenan, you, you, you missed out the last question. I'm gonna to turn to you first then on this one. I think they both go together quite nicely because I was gonna say, uh, based on, on uh, Zoe and Lauren's comments, so one other thing that's happened with the pandemic and there's been a, a requirement for creativity. And so it's, it's gone beyond uh, kind of what I would, we would have called job carving uh, in the past. And now it's more like uh, we can start the relationship with the employer with, we call it a workplace analysis. Um, and basically just tell us about your business. And we, before we even talk about what jobs you have open and what candidates, uh, and we do like an analysis and 
you know, one of the things that happened with a, a really cool uh, new sports store from France that's set up around here called Cathlon. I think it's big in Europe, but uh, uh, they were hiring. And typically what they do is uh, they look to have all their employees able to work in every department over time, uh, including cash and other duties. And uh, we kind of looked at that and that that's a tough ask for a lot of our job seekers. But we noticed there are seasonal things like building bicycles where suddenly they have to build like a bazillion bicycles in the spring. And mm -hmm. we thought of a gentleman that could really knock that out of the park. And we talked about, you know, is there opportunities for specializations? And they're like, what do you mean? What about someone that just wanted to build bicycles? Oh, that would be a fantastic. Um, and so it wasn't really, it wasn't a job they had posted. And so uh, that was essentially a, a creative outcome. And so to connect that to your question, uh, so, in our, we are now hiring in our, you know, kind of our uh, employment supports team, uh, including people with disabilities. Their job is to do this type of workplace analysis and go into uh, an environment and listen to the employer's needs, look at the environment, and make these recommendations as a job. So, people with disabilities need to be paid to do this work, um, and it's going to be a career for some people. And I just see this as an important element that is just launching, but it's going to grow and it's going to be really good for employers. It's going to make them uh, better for all their employees. This is the feedback we always get. People who don't identify as disabled come out and saying, this is so much better now. This meeting, I understand why we have these now. Uh, this process, we're working more efficiently together as a team. I understand what this department's doing. So I just think it, that's the key is this is a career for people and they should be paid for it. And, and then Lauren and then Zoe, do, do, do you see um, this stress, this tension between wanting to engage people and to use their experience to benefit others and to make the, the workplace better and perhaps what may, be, may feel unreasonable to the individual? Um, I know in my experience sometimes, right, uh, it can lead to stereotyping for certain mm -hmm. individuals with certain disabilities, right? Oh, this person has autism, automatically they need this accommodation because other people with autism needed it. And sometimes it does take away that individualized approach to their employment. Um, that's some of the issues I see, but I also see exactly as other panelists have said, right? Like it really, a lot of these accommodations actually are helping other individuals, we've had, you know, things where we've written out um, starting duties and ending duties of someone's task, and they've actually adapted this to other employees. And it's now part of their training is our accommodations we've made. So it can be simple things as well, right? Checklists, um, just uh, even pictures of what a task would look like is now being incorporated in a lot of small businesses to their, uh, their training modules as well. And, and I think there's some really, I think one of the things that we obviously always talk about disability, we talk about a disability community. Uh, and I think understanding and helping employers understand that just because you may have a diagnosis or a condition in one area doesn't mean that actually you know anything whatsoever about how you deal with a different set of needs. Um, and I think the classic one I've seen is some people who are, who are deaf or hard of hearing being asked, yeah, so how does that work for blind people? Going, I don't know. Um, what? Uh, I have no idea. Um, and Zoe, I mean, have you, have you found that, yeah, that sometimes we, we expect too much of our employees with disabilities as if, you know, they automatically understand the abilities and the, and the ways of meeting needs for everyone? It's so important to talk about that because every experience, every project's experience is so specific to their needs. For example, someone with my condition may need a wheelchair, I need a walker. Same condition does yeah. not mean same accommodation whatsoever. And the assumption that, well, you're disabled, you must know this, you must know about every disability is, is just ridiculous to me personally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, 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 I, many people with disabilities say, yeah, I can, I, I'm an expert in me. And I can tell you about where some of those things may be similar, others may be similar, but I can promise you that there'll also be many differences between us. 
And and maybe uh, I just did want to give a chance. Um, as well. I've got one more question, which I will go try and get very quick responses to. And um, there's a lot of messaging going out to employers that says um, employing people with disabilities is a really good business decision. It's going to uh, help um, reduce your costs. You're going to be have more inclusive products, uh, and so on and so on. Um, and I just wonder. Do, do you agree? Is, is this a good argument? Are risks in, in, in that argument that the business will benefit if you do this? Um, and again, maybe, maybe Lauren, again, maybe, maybe you can just kick us off on this one. So I agree with a lot of the points and a lot of them can be selling features. The other thing though, it, it sometimes can put uh, individuals or job seekers at risk for what we call tokenism, right? They have an employee standing by the door waving to people. I, there obviously is value to that, but they're not adding any value to the business, right? Uh, to a certain extent or, you know, performing a role. And no, but we hire exclusively and the individuals like, I have all these skills I want to give to you. Let me give them. And they're just like, no, no, you're fine, right? They're not allowing job growth. Um, but uh, another big thing like with the statistics and, and showing that with an employer is um, it puts a lot of pressure on our job seekers, right? And it puts a lot of pressure on the employer. A lot of them forget you're supposed to treat them like any other employee. And mm -hmm. the amount of times we've got a phone call being like, you know, they did something wrong for the 10th time. And like, you know, any other employee, they would have been gone by now, but you know, I haven't talked to them yet because they have a disability. And I'm like, well, how can you improve if you don't know? Yep. Right. A lot of um, issues with that. Employers need the education to know, to treat everyone um, like any other employee, to allow them that growth. And I think there is, there is something there which is, is quite important, which is sometimes to recognize that with all the best will in the world, with all the accommodations and support, this may not be the right job for a person just as it may not be the right job for any person. And I think working with the advisors, the supporters, as well as the person with a disability themselves, to have that discussion when things aren't working well, to think about creative ways of trying new attempts is great. But sometimes probably both people know this isn't working, but both people are very nervous of coming forward and saying, what do we do about it? And, and it almost said that's a point which was made right at the beginning. I think people talked about the importance of coming forward and talking. We've seen so much more happening around hidden disability. People coming forward and talking about hidden disabilities, which has included mental health. And we've also, I think one of the things that we've talked about quite a lot today is touching upon hidden assistive technologies. The things that are hidden within your devices, hidden within your phone, uh, your your computer and so on. So really, I, I just would like to uh, just with each of our speakers. And whilst we're having this this question, please, if there's any questions from anybody in the audience, put them in the chat now. This is your last chance. Speak now or forever. Hold your peace, as we say. Um, speakers, how do we take away that wall? How do we unlock that discussion further? Not just people coming forward about disability, but also awareness and knowledge of what the technologies, what the accommodations are and how we meet needs. Um, Keena, do you want to just open that up in terms of intellectual disability? How do we get that openness in that field? Yeah, and I just wanted to quickly go back to your, your last point. Uh, it was very well explained by Lauren, but I think there's also a connection too. We had to be really careful. Uh, I know those messages started coming out from employment networks years ago. This is a great business decision. But then you tunnel down and you go, well, they're talking about retention. I'm like, so in a way we're saying, you can exploit this population because they're afraid to leave this job. So if you hire them, they'll stay. And so we've moved away from that messaging and really just focused on, we are going to, we are an employment service that's going to bring you a great employee to fit this need. And that's the benefit to you. It's not like this greater picture of these statistics about this population. We might reference those vaguely in the presentation, but it's really about the person. And then to your point that you just asked, and you also mentioned about uh, mental health, and I think that is, um, and the pandemic has really opened 
you know, new doors that, and it's not going away. I was worried. Are we just going to say, okay, it's over now. We don't, we don't think like this anymore. And no, like I go on LinkedIn today, there's going to be like 20% of the articles are about, uh, Hey, like people are quitting. Do you know why? And you, so you better smarten up about this stuff and, and here's some things you need to learn and, and, uh, how to hear people and uh, how to meet their needs and how to listen to them, how to invite all that. So it seems to be happening uh, quite organically. And then it's just a matter of there's going to be certain populations or certain disabilities or certain conditions within mental health or within disability that are going to just be on the edge of that curve. And you'd have to work on advocating to bring them in. And the positive news I would say is it's I have not, it's not with malice. I'm just not seeing that. It's more, just, I didn't hear, I've never heard of this. Uh, but the, the response to I've never heard of this has changed a lot. It's I've never heard of this, tell me more versus I've never heard of this, not sure I wanna go there. So I would just say, I, I don't see that as going away. It's only gonna move forward and conferences like this will help. <laughs> That's very good. Um, Zoe, what, I mean, how, how would you uh, unlock that and and, encourage that openness um, and dialogue and discussion that we, we obviously desperately need? This is a, is a really good question because it's something I deal with on a daily basis. And even just for myself personally, I've only recently in the past few years started talking about my disability. For me, it used to be like a taboo thing I should hide from people. Mm. I think it's so, so important that we, we talk about it. We just, we share our stories, without feeling ashamed and feeling the need to hide. Share our stories and make other people feel comfortable to share theirs. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it all starts to have conversations and not judge people. I think that's really where it all <laughs> comes down to. Yeah, and, and Lauren, um, your thoughts? Uh, just piggybacking off of Zoe, right? Is just creating space, uh, creating space for talking about inclusion talking about um, hiring inclusively and understanding the merits of it and um, understanding that this is an untapped labor pool of individuals with disabilities that have amazing skills that they're able to provide an employer and um, keeping open-mindedness and understanding, you know, every individual is the expert of their own story. Um, so allowing them to have space to speak and see what accommodations might possibly need or possibly not need it at all. And that's something we got to keep in mind too. Sometimes we automatically jump to accommodation, which sometimes they don't need any on a, in a workplace or it's already adapted to them. And I, and I think those expectations of employers are really important. Employers and businesses have gone through one of the worst cycles um, in, in memory in terms of keeping their businesses going, being able to keep people in employment. And I think we, we have to ask ourselves, what is a reasonable expectation of an employer at the current time? Is, it, is our reasonable expectation actually to comply with policy and to do the best they can uh, to follow government policy and accessibility policy? Or is, is this a time when actually there's an opportunity to do much more? And just like when we were speaking about how people with disabilities may or may not be willing to go that extra mile, uh, I think we should recognise that employers are also in that situation as to how far can they go now? And if they can't go now, probably the next question is, well, when will you be ready to go that bit further? And what can we do to help you? move on a bit further. And I think with that comes then that, that question about from, from each of you really, where would you point people towards? Uh, and Keenan's just shared the discussion. There's almost psychic, uh, Keenan. Where would you point people towards as extra advice, resources and information to say, okay, we want you to go that extra mile. We want you to be part of that open dialogue. And here's something to help you start down that process. And Kenny, you're just putting one uh, the, a case study about inclusive here. Aaron, would you, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that one? Sure. And uh, I'll post another, which is uh, hireforTalent.ca. Uh, and uh, the second uh, video there from that link, it's uh, a local employer we work with called ViralClean that makes PPE here in Ottawa. And that's a great private sector example. And then I posted the, the public service example. But uh, 
if you look at that, that case study I posted, the reason is uh, it really looks at um, how we identified uh, the barriers that existed in the federal public service to more inclusive hiring of this particular population and then uh, some of the solutions and then kind of addressing your question, uh, what would happen next to really solve this? And there's, you know, Canada's actually doing pretty well on a lot of this, but we looked at uh, Spain as a great example. Uh, there's an organization called Plena Inclusion, and uh, it, someone else put it in the chat about what's the balance between like requiring employers to do things and then, you know, uh, encouragement, carrot stick sort of thing. And in Spain, as the, the Federal Public Service led out by saying, okay, 2% of the Federal Public Service is going to be uh, people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, so that was just, you know, they just felt things are not moving uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to incentivize uh, with a bit of a stick, uh, I, even as we continue to uh, encourage with, with all the types of carrots that we've talked about. Uh, and one of the things that interests me when we talk about resources and advice, I, I've been here in, in Brussels, uh, and most of the speakers at the event are from large multinational corporates, talking about their experience of employing people with disabilities, uh, talking about their experience of making accommodations. Uh, and Zoe, I know that you, you, you have a particular experience in terms of small businesses. Where would you give guidance to small businesses? Because sometimes the advice, such as looking at this multinational bank and how they're employing people with autism, if you're a small business, it's really hard to draw anything sensible from that for your practice. Who would you point small businesses towards? Well, I think that um, just to speak to what you mentioned before about how people are saying like, oh, look, I am employing people with disabilities. I mean, it's great and good for you. <laughs> but the truth is, is that we should all be doing that without feeling the need for, for recognition. I mean, the disabled population makes up a huge portion of the population. And I don't think it should be just seen as like, oh, here's one person with disability, we're inclusive. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, to say that, but, but with regards to small business, I think small business and disability is only now becoming kind of combined, if that makes sense. I feel like up until recently, people didn't even imagine someone with disability owning a business or being an entrepreneur or being in this field at all because they thought we weren't able to. And they thought, oh, you're disabled. Why would, like, you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't want to. And I think it's only recently, slowly but surely, we're realizing that self-employment is actually a great option for disabled people because it's more flexible. You can work from home. You can create your own hours. You can do your own accommodations. Like, it's just, it's so much easier for us to be self-employed. And I think that that's something that we all need to, to realize is that it is an option. And I think I think it just needs to be talked about more. Excellent, thank you. And, and then Lauren, uh, anything, where would you point either large or small businesses towards in terms of getting the extra advice and information they need to make a difference? Uh, so our agency also does uh, walkthroughs. We've had uh, locally the Weston downtown asked for us walkthrough and we went through and seen any accommodations that possibly need to be in place, not just for our job seekers, but any job seeker. And we actually ended up getting one successful for that role. Um, another really great resource is for employers is through uh, the uh, CASE website. They have an amazing um, employer guide um, full of of resources um, for individuals um, looking to hire more inclusively and how to go about doing that. Thank you. Well, we're coming very much towards the end now, and there's a few more uh, associations being flagged up. And do anybody who's in the audience who's got a resource that they think others might find interesting, please put them into the chat. Um, that networking, that sharing is unbelievably important. Um, I think my, my final comment here is that there's so much that is possible. We have the technologies that can make a difference. We have emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, internet of things, virtual reality. We're going to see things like autonomous vehicles making a difference in the day-to-day -day lives uh, in the next 10 years uh, and so on. 
But I'd also so I'd recommend that you know, do do think widely, do think broadly, do think for the future. Um, but I just wanted to uh, to share with you um, uh, one or two stories, uh, and one story which I think is, is interesting in terms of um, what can you do, how can you make things differently, and how small businesses and entrepreneurship can make a difference. Um, I was in Bangladesh uh, a few years ago working uh, in some of the villages uh, around people with disabilities. And lots of interesting things happened there. But it was really interesting, an employment scheme that was happening there. And the employment scheme gave people with disabilities $200 to start their own business. And what this meant for one man I met is he'd spent $180 buying chickens. So he could farm chickens in the village. And as a man with a very, very serious and severe scoliosis, a man with very difficult speech, he moved very quickly from being completely dependent on a few dollars a month benefit from the government to actually being able to sell chickens and eggs to several villages locally and live completely independent of benefits and support his entire family. So I'll go back to something, which I think it was Zoe, may have been Lauren, about thinking outside the box, recognizing that employment takes many, many different forms. The accommodations we can offer make many, many different forms. And using those and thinking about those will make a huge difference. So with that in mind, in terms of our, I want to thank all of our speakers from my behalf. We've talked a lot about the difference in how we make accommodations, about how the changing environment means that those uh, differences uh, have to be made and the processes are changing. And we've also talked quite a bit about how the technologies, many of those technologies, those assistive and accessible products are available to us now, they're on our devices, but also some of those additional device, uh, solutions that we might need not, are not always expensive, they're less than $500. So that awareness, that understanding and building flexible and resilient processes that respond to change are what will make sure that we do have fully accessible and inclusive workplaces right across Canada in the future. And I do uh, want to mention, uh, you know, there are uh, things that we have at a distinct ability that are there to help you and I hope that many of those will be of assistance in the future. So with that thought, let me hand back to Dean uh, and can I thank our speakers and our audience for your attention. Dean. Well, thank you so much. I'm just, uh, I'm just, this, this whole two day event has been so fascinating. So many new ideas, so many conf confirmations of the same ideas. And uh, this panel particularly uh, provided insight into we're just how much we've progressed and yet how far we still have to go. So I want to personally thank you, Dave, Keenan, Lauren, and Zoe for your participation. And uh, thank you make, to make the final session a very, very worthy one. I now have the, uh, the pleasure of wrapping up this whole event. And uh, there's so much to talk about. I I'm glad you ran a few seconds over there, Dave, to keep me from uh, keeping people late. So I'm not gonna do a lot of it, but I wanted to highlight the, the first day um, led off by, by Susan Blanchard, who is the, uh, the director, who is the vice president of, at Carleton and also the director of the CAN Canadian Accessibility Associ Network. And I, I really encourage everyone to look into the network because individuals can join. You don't have to be organizations. You can join as individuals and, and the work that's happening across the country is really quite incredible. We then had, uh, we had Yuda Traveris speak and I don't know how many of you were there for that, but she blows me away every time she speaks because she, she just sees the big picture. And, and what really stood out from that for me was the idea of a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, there's so much knowledge being gained. There's, there's all this fast paced change going on and some of it's just tremendous. And other bit is very dangerous because at the same time that we learn new technologies, we may find that the ones that we've come accustomed to aren't serviced anymore and, and it becomes very difficult for some people. So, so much, so much going on. Yet, I think if we keep an eye on the prize, 
we were able to gain as much as we can without losing what we've already gained. And so that, that's, that was important. It was important to, to listen to the folks uh, from Queen's University who talked about adaptation and accommodation and research. And, and there's, a, there, there's tremendous work happening. The same thing can be said for the, uh, the folks who just spoke from Tetra and all the great ideas that are coming out. Uh, I could talk for quite a while if you'd let me, but I know that my job here is to wrap things up, so I'm not going to. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I want to end the day by thanking the Enable Ottawa Planning Committee. And, and I don't know if you're allowed to do this, uh, Michaela and Aiden, but I wish the two of you would put your faces on screen with the rest of us, because I'd really like people to re realize who, who the real stars of this show were. And uh, there's Aiden and Michaela together. So uh, we had we had so much work done. And, and the nice part is it wasn't just Aiden and Michaela, it was everyone on the Reed team. We have a really strong team now. And, and uh, we had a few issues during the course of the two days with the, with the platform we were using, but my goodness, everything got solved without uh, without a major delay or inconvenience to the participants. So I, I, I was thrilled to be part of it uh, and I'm thrilled to acknowledge the people who did all the hard lifting. Uh, we also should acknowledge our partners, the City of Ottawa and uh, the City of Ottawa actually had their accessibility awareness day this morning. Uh, so it's not tomorrow in case you were listening to, uh, to Jim's talk when he kicked things off this morning because that was really planned for yesterday. So. <laughs> It, it turns out that uh, they had a tremendous session this morning. And the thing is, this whole Accessibility Awareness Week offers all of us a chance to interact with one another and to get to know uh, what's going on in the world and to become a part of the movement. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. I'm so glad that we're doing it. I'm glad we, you know, it was a benefit for us to switch to online because being in person only really limited it to more of the local community. And now we're even, we got great thoughts in the future of making this enabled Canada because everyone can join from anywhere. And so keep your, keep your eyes on that for the future. But uh, really, really is a pleasure to have been a part of it and to have accomplished so much. And, and there's more events going on the rest of this week. So take a look at the calendar. Look, look at the federal government's National Accessibility Week calendar. There's some great events. I know that I'll be attending a few more and really excited, really excited for what we are doing and, and more intrigued than ever. You know, I may be getting old, but I sure don't want to move out of this field right now because there's just so many good things happening. I, I want to thank our other partners, Tetra, who spoke and Independent Living Canada. It's been a pleasure organizing this with the other groups in the community, and we will continue to strive to do that. Um, I'd all like to also like to thank AI Media who provided the captioning and, and the, uh, the interpretation. And thank you to all the interpreters that participated with us. It's been a pleasure having that service available. Uh, I'm sorry a few times we kind of lost it between the two, between Zoom and, and uh, Feed Loop, but for the most part, everyone got the benefit of that. And uh, I, I, I have a few questions for Feed Loop, which I know, I'm sure our committee will will address with them and hope that they learn from this, that the accessibility improvements they could make and, and stay, stay as a partner with us in the future. I'd like, to, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all the speakers. There was no disappointments. It was, all, it was a great, great event all the way through. And uh, all of our team at, some of our team came up, uh, all of our team at Reed just everyone put it all in for, for to support these two fantastic ladies who are front and center on the screen now and, and, and make it a great success. So uh, please uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for attending. I, I saw the numbers going up and up as we were going through the day today, which is a very encouraging thing. And look forward to uh, having the opportunity to meet with you all again next year and, and many times between now and then. So. With, with uh, great respect to our real leaders, Michaela and Aiden, I, I thank you for joining. Have a great day. Everyone, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Dean.